Amen. Thank you, Mona, as always. Um, good morning. So if you have your Bibles, look with me. Matthew chapter 6. We're in the middle of the Sermon on the Mount. Today, we're going to begin uh, looking at the, the Lord's Prayer. So we'll look at the first part of the Lord's Prayer today and look at the second part next week, because there's too much just in those couple of verses for us to cover it all well in one week. And uh, because it is in my nature to slow down, that's what we'll do. We'll slow down. Someone pointed out we'll be doing the Sermon on the Mount a year from now still. <laughs> you know, uh, well, since they said that, we definitely will. So, all right. So Jesus, last week we looked at how Jesus is concerned that his people will develop this uh, surface level spirituality that will not be real. That uh, being spiritual or the idea that, that I can appear to be godly and righteous and faithful, and all of those things, when re in reality, I am not. These are things that are easy to fake. And so Jesus is calling his followers to live out of more than just the surface of things. He's calling us to live out of that deep, secret, private place in our lives where we meet with the Lord, and where we receive through His Spirit, His Word, where we understand His Word, where we yield and commit to Him and to His Word and to His ways. There's this place in our lives where we meet with the Lord in that way. And we are to live out of that place. We are to speak out of that place. We are to make our decisions based on that place in our lives and the time we have spent there where we meet with the Lord. So that when we live, we will not be doing acts of righteousness, Jesus tells, describes them, to impress others. Instead, they will be done with an audience of one. Just, just between me and the Lord, and what I say and what I do is something that the Lord and I have already met about in my heart. Uh, and I'm living out of that place. It's not done to impress anybody. And so... Jesus is going, in the text we'll look at today, Jesus is going to expand on what it means to pray. His disciples were instructed to talk intimately with God as children would their father, making requests known in simple, clear, everyday language, confident that God already knows what they need. Now he's already said that the Lord Almighty is not impressed with our verbosity and our, with our wordiness. The Lord is not impressed with how we can talk. That doesn't register with the Almighty at all. He already knows everything. We have nothing we can tell Him. Right? Okay. And so Jesus says our prayers are to be direct and simple. I think so that we can have time to listen. And then to take in what the Lord is saying and decide whether or not we are going to respond to what God is saying. Is it going to shape our lives at all? Now, prayer is not an event. I told you it's not something we put on the schedule, although we do. Uh, prayer is not writing letters to Santa Claus. Uh, prayer is... It's living in the presence of the Lord and developing the habit of, of receiving the presence and the word of the Lord into our lives, processing that and responding to that, both in our hearts and our affections and in what we do and in what we say. So in verses 9 and 10 that we'll look at today, Jesus teaches his disciples to pray so that their lives are oriented to living in God's presence and to yielding to the presence of God. In other words, you know, first things must be first. And so first of all, 
followers of Jesus Christ have to understand what it means that God is our Father and we are living in His presence. And so Jesus has some significant things to say about that. Now next week we'll look at verses 11 and 13, 11 through 13, and then verse 14, where Jesus gives examples of the kinds of petitions we are to make to the Lord and uh, the significance of those things. And so we'll look at that next week. For now, look with me in Matthew chapter 6, starting with verse 9. Jesus says, This then is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So the first, there, there are three things that Jesus says here. And these petitions for us, these three petitions are to pray for God's delivering rule to happen on earth. We want for God's reign to be established in our lives and in everyone's life on earth. This prayer, according to the way Jesus teaches it, is not for getting what we want, but it's all about bending our wants toward what God wants. Woo! I can see you like that. <laughs> so let me say that again. Our prayers are not about telling God what we want and trying to get the Almighty to bend Himself to our will. No matter how desperate or sincere or fervent our prayer voice. When we pray, we are telling God, you can bend our wants to your will. And, and really what Jesus is saying, if that's not how we're going to pray, don't pray. If, if you're wanting to convince or persuade the Almighty to fulfill your will, it's better not to pray. God is not an idol to reflect our desires. God is the supreme ruler of the universe. And He knows all things. He is good above all possible concepts of good. He is right in all things. He knows the ending since before there was a beginning. He does not bend to our will. We bend to His. And when we pray, that should be our posture and our desire. Otherwise, we are barking up the wrong tree. No offense, Max. So, God wants our prayers, all of our lives, to have a clear, kingdom-centered focus. And the people who can pray like this are those who are learning to make the kingdom of God and His righteousness their primary aim in life. And so, here's how people like that pray. First of all, when I pray... I express my desire for God's name to be hallowed or sanctified. When I pray, I express my desire for God's name to be hallowed or sanctified. So the significance in Jesus' mind is on the name of God. And I'm praying for God's name, His reputation, His glory to be set apart as special or holy. It's to plead that a rebellious world would no longer reject its creator who has revealed himself to us by name. It's a prayer that the peoples of the world might, in the present, honor God in word and action. Now that's significant because make no mistake, at the end of all things, every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord. But what Jesus is saying is right now, this prayer is about doing, confessing Jesus as Lord right now. And, and to actually mean it. You're Lord. You are Lord. So it's a concern for God's glory, His reputation, His name, His word, and His ways. Now, God's people were warned in the Old Testament not to prove not to profane God's holy name or damage God's reputation among the nations by living wrongly. And in the Old Testament, 
Uh, To know God's name is to know God. And yet, His name was defamed by the Jews and the Gentiles alike. And so, when the Jews prayed, their prayers anticipated that in the time of God's reign on earth, God's name would be hallowed as it should be. And so Jesus is teaching us to echo this hope and implies that that time is right now. This is the time for us to hallow or honor or respect God's name on earth. His name uh, means something. And in Old Testament times especially, the name was held to be bound up with the person in some way. The name of someone meant meant something. So you didn't name your young men Les. You see what I'm saying? That's prophetic. What's your name? My name's Les. Really? You want to name someone like Rock. That's better. Rock. Rocky. That's me. See, the, the name and the qualities associated with it were bound up together with who the person was. So referring to the name of God points to his specific personal identity as made known in his deeds and what he has said about himself. I come to know who God is and what he is like by his actions and by what he tells me about himself. So God has revealed His name to us. And in Hebrew, the name is Yahweh. Uh, It's a form of the verb to be. And has been interpreted to mean I am that I am, or I shall be what I shall be. It emphasizes God's unchangeable covenant faithfulness toward His people. I am. I always have been. I always will be. This is who I am. I am always thus. And in the Old Testament, people gave specific names to God based on their experience with God. For instance, in Jeremiah 23, 6, uh, God is called our righteousness. In Genesis 24, 14, Abraham says, Yahweh will provide. In Exodus 15, 26, uh, God is described as the one who heals you. In Judges 6.24, Yahweh is peace. And in Psalm 23, verse 1, David says, Yahweh is my shepherd. I wonder, how well do you know God? And based on your experience with God, what name could you give God? What is your testimony about God's presence and activity in your life? When the 1960s ended, San Francisco's Haight-Ashbury district reverted to high rent. And so many of the the hippies moved down the coast to Santa Cruz, California. And there they had children, and they didn't name their children things like Melissa or Brett. People in the mountains that surrounded Santa Cruz grew accustomed to their children playing with other children named Frisbee or Time Warp or Spring Fever. And eventually children like Moonbeam and Earth and Love and Precious Promise all enrolled in public school. And that's when the kindergarten teachers first met Fruit Stand. Every fall, according to tradition, parents bravely apply name tags to their children, kiss them goodbye, and send them off to school on the bus. So it was for fruit stand. The teachers thought the boy's name was odd, but they tried to make the best of it. Would you like to play with the blocks, fruit stand, they offered. And later, fruit stand, how about a snack? And he accepted hesitantly. By the end of the day, his name didn't seem much odder than Sunrays, you know. So at dismissal time, the teachers led the children out to the buses. Fruit stand, do you know which one is your bus? And he didn't answer. And that wasn't strange because he hasn't answered them all day. Lots of children are shy on the first day of school. It really didn't matter because the teachers had instructed the parents to write the names on one side of the name tag and on the other side to write the stop 
that their bus was supposed to stop at. So the teacher simply turned over the tag, and there printed neatly was the word Anthony. I know, when, when we pray, we're guilty of assuming a lot of things. And sometimes I think we, we assume we have the, the Almighty figured out. And what Jesus says is that we should think twice. To hallow God's name means to hold it in reverence. To hold Him in reverence. It's to honor Him, to glorify Him, and exalt Him and all that He does. See, to hold God's, to hold God's name sacred is to have a humility of spirit, a gratitude of heart, an earnest study of God's work until observation changes into sincere worship. It is to be reverent before all that God is and stands for. It also involves receiving God's Word into my life and obeying it because His Word bears His holy name. And I want to obey so that God will appear glorious in this world. We should pray, our Father, how may we set apart your name as holy? And I would encourage you to ask God to give you an idea of how God's name could be hallowed or made holy in your day, throughout your day. How may we set apart your name as holy? The second thing I want to point out today is that when I pray, I express my desire for two things, for God's kingdom to come and for his will to be done. Two things in verse 10. When I pray, I'm expressing my desire for God's kingdom to come and for his will to be done. This is to acknowledge that the world is rebellious and in need of redemption. It is to pray for God's deliverance and for us to receive His Word and then to do His Word. It is to pray that in a comprehensive way, people would come to act in conformity to the will of God. So as we pray for God's name to be hallowed, and for God's kingdom to come, and God's will to be done, the idea is that we would become co-laborers in the kingdom. Lord, open my eyes that I may see the possibilities of my circumstances and the people who are in my day today. Open up my understanding so that I can participate in your will and your kingdom. And the idea is that the more we pray for his kingdom to come, the more we see clearly and compassionately the wrong, the injustice, the violence, the sadness, and the suffering in this sinful and rebellious world. I am usually moved to pray all the more earnestly for God's reign to come in my life at least and to use me and the world around me to advance His kingdom and accomplish His will. Jesus Himself pioneered the way by being totally devoted to practicing God's will. In heaven, God's will is perfectly done now. Wherever God is, in His presence right now, His will is accomplished perfectly because there's nothing in His presence to hinder His will. And the prayer looks for a similar state of affairs in my heart and in the world in which I live. So I am to pray that God might send His Son to complete the Father's plans and establish His kingdom forever. I'm to long for the day when God brings all of this to completion and he makes all things right and all things new. Amen. Come quickly, Lord Jesus, yes. and establish your kingdom forever. Yes. I am to pray that God will move me to participate even now in where his kingdom is advancing in my life. I'm to participate in God's grace by receiving His Word and doing His Word. Uh, Every day, I'm to participate where God's reign is advancing 
in this world and in my life. Lord, give me the grace to be faithful in the work given to me for your purposes and for your glory. I would also say that when I pray, I'm committing myself to actively work out God's divine purposes. I'm saying, Lord, I'm going to be on your team. You can count on me. I'm, I'm going to be there. I'm going to show up. I'm going to be responsible. I'm going to receive and then act on your word. I'm one of, I'm one of your family. So when I pray, I'm making sure to align myself with God's purposes. A man named Bobby Richardson played second base for the New York Yankees from 1955 to 1966. He became the only World Series most valuable player to be selected from the losing team when he won the award for his play in the 1960 World Series. And that does my heart good. I'm always happy to hear about the Yankees losing, especially the World Series. Years later, at a meeting of the Fellowship of Christian Athletes, Bobby Richardson offered a prayer that is a classic in brevity. He prayed, Dear God, Your will, nothing more, nothing less, nothing else. Amen. That's what it comes down to. It's just that simple. That is how you and I are to pray. Until Jesus returns at the end of the age to establish God's rule forever, I must choose each day to live for God's kingdom and not mine. Lord, your will, nothing more, nothing less, nothing else. Your will be done, not mine. Until Jesus uh, returns and establishes God's kingdom forever, there is a need for this prayer. Because even though the kingdom is already here, the kingdom is still absent from many hearts. And God's grace makes this change possible. God's grace catches us when we fall. So I want to increasingly acknowledge Jesus Christ as my sovereign king. I'm praying, God, show me the areas of my life which are out of alignment with your word and your will. And when I pray that, I need to listen and expect God to speak to me through his word and through other ways as his spirit works in my life. God will answer. And when he speaks, I am to repent. I'm to turn from sin and self-centeredness and turn to the word of God in the ways of God. I'm to pray, Lord, your kingdom may come in my thought life. Lord, may your kingdom and your will to be done in my marriage. May your kingdom come in my use of money and resources. May your will be done in all of my relationships, especially my relationships with those who are closest to me, my my family and my friends. Lord, may your will be done and not my will. So I want to ask, in what areas of my daily life can I yield to the Lordship of Christ and seek God's purposes and ways rather than my own? How can I yield? I was reading this week about how someone wrote a letter to Emily Post. Do you remember Emily Post? And she was an etiquette expert of another generation And they asked, what is the correct procedure when one is invited to the White House but has a previous engagement? Emily Post replied, an invitation to dine at the White House is a command. And it automatically cancels any other engagement. I learned that when the White House set up shop here a few years ago. They don't make requests. Here's what I'm telling you. The king has invited us into his presence through prayer. He's your king. And it is an invitation, but he's your king. I meet with my king in that deep, secret place 
in my life where I encounter and respond to His presence and His Word and His will. My time in the presence of God is to orient my, myself to the Lordship of Jesus Christ in every area of my life. I am to bend my wanter and my will to His so that I seek His will and I desire His glory. I yield my desires to His desires. And I do what He says. And then I trust Him in all things. So this morning I want to put two different kinds of commitments before you. First of all, I invite you to make Jesus your Savior. And then willingly make Jesus your King in every area of your life. Man. Trust in what Jesus did through His death on the cross to bring salvation for your sin. And then make Jesus your Lord uh, by following Him every day, taking seriously His Word and living to accomplish His purposes for His glory. Secondly, I invite you to make a commitment to meet with your King and to live in His presence so that you will be able to make His name holy, so that you'll be able to allow more of His reign into your life and to make His and to work for His purposes, both now and forever. Are you ready to pray, you know, to live in the presence of the Lord, to do His Word, to accomplish His purposes, to bend your life, your will, your desires to God's Word in ways? I'm going to pray, and then Alan Ray will come and lead us in a time of response. I wonder, how do you need to respond to God's Word today? And whatever it is that God is saying to you, you can listen and respond to Him right where you are while we sing. But if you feel led, you can come to the altar and pray. Or if you feel led, I'll be standing down here while we're singing. You can come and pray with me. And then as always, when the service is over, I'll be out there in the foyer. If you wanted to come and, and uh, share something with me or ask me some questions, that's where I will be. This is our time to respond to what God is saying to us. So let's pray together. Lord, I confess that uh, when I pray, I don't always acknowledge your name and who you are, your word or your ways or your purposes or your glory. I'm too caught up and what's in front of me, my circumstances, and my relationships. I'm too overwhelmed by my plight, Lord. And I pray that you would adjust my perspective, that you would bend my will to yours and save me the angst of trying to bend you to mine. Increase my faith, Lord, so that I can trust you in all things. But Lord, more than anything, Draw me into your presence so that I can know you, so that I can know your word, so that my faith can be increased, so that I will not fear to yield, to follow, to obey, to trust in all things. And Lord, I pray for these others here and for those who are watching online. I pray that you would draw them with cords of loving kindness into your presence where they can know you, hear from you, and live for you. May your kingdom come, and may your will be done. Amen. We love you. We do trust you. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Would you stand with me while we sing today?